This is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire Books, and I'm here with a review of Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. So as you can see, it's got an edgy cover. I did not read this at school in front of my students because is it obscene? No. Does it suggest obscenity? Oh yeah. And this book is very much about sort of taboos and limitations we place on ourselves and pushing at all of those boundaries, which takes a weirdly specific plot and then makes it something that I think is universally worth thinking about. So the basic premise of Milk Fed is that the main character, Rachel, is living this really awful life, honestly. She's in a job at a talent agency that she hates. She has an eating disorder and just brutally restricts her calories. So if you don't want to, if you don't like eating disorders or body issues in your literature, run from this book right now. Stop watching this review. Go, because it is stressful. So I actually found her whole life to be super trapped and stressful. And one of her quirks is that she goes to this frozen yogurt place and she wants it filled exactly to the top. Like she's counted the calories, no extra yogurt. She's very obsessive about like the correct ways to eat things. Like she has bizarre eating rituals and also how much she is allowed to eat. So she's someone who clearly loves food and flavor and who is restricting this from herself in just the absolute most torturous way possible. Um, at the same time, you know, there's a woman who whose family runs this yogurt store. She starts working there more regularly and she is unapologetically fat. She has a great sense of humor about life and Rachel finds herself attracted to this woman and the story and the book is basically the story of their relationship that they develop. So it's a really... So this story is really interesting on a number of levels. You know, Rachel prioritizes thinness and really values that in herself. She develops this sexual obsession with Miriam, who is fat and who is everything that she is afraid that she's going to become, which is something that she tells her therapist at the beginning of the novel. And so it's very much about kind of the line, right, between something that we really reject and then secretly really want, like how we confront our fears and what's kind of gross and abusive about it, right? Is that Rachel is working these issues out on another person's body. And Miriam has needs of her own. You know, she's an Orthodox Jewish woman who has a really close relationship with her family. Rachel is a reformed Jew. And it's just really clear that they have very different worldviews and value sets that collide as their relationship intensifies. So, you know, there are scenes where Rachel goes over for Shabbat at Miriam's house and she's just really touched by the warmth of her family. One of the reasons that Rachel has the issue she has is because of her mother and her mother's controllingness. Um, actually, the book begins with her going on a contact detox from her mom, which opens the way, which opens the way for her obsession with Miriam to begin. So Rachel wants Miriam partially because Miriam is living a life that Rachel's afraid of the consequences of living as somebody who loves food and is obsessed with the fear of becoming fat. She's also, I think, in love with what Miriam seems to have in terms of her family. And it looks to Rachel as though she's very accepted by this warm and loving family. And that's something that she also does not have. So basically Miriam is a version of what she wishes her life maybe could be, or she represents a freedom that Rachel denies herself. And so all of this kind of plays out on this like sexual relationship that they enter into. And so, you know, Rachel and Miriam develop an attachment and it's really clear that Miriam is concerned about the relationship because she's not willing to come out as gay and, you know, fall in love with a woman and live her life that way because she remains attached to her family. She's eventually going to bow to the needs of that family. And so that's also part of the conflict that they have. Even though Rachel knows that that's how Miriam feels, like there's a point in the book where she asks Miriam to tell her a story and Miriam gives her an allegory that is essentially about the fact that she is attracted to women, but she values her family more. So she's going to figure out how to like men instead. Um, you know, Rachel doesn't totally listen to that and still really puts effort into seducing Miriam. They do have some trysts 
and then things fall apart. So this book touches a lot because it's so focused on Rachel's perspective, right? This book makes you think a lot about what is Miriam thinking and feeling and like, why is Rachel overriding all these boundaries that Miriam has? You know, Miriam responds because she's attracted to Rachel, but she's also clearly conflicted about what's going on. Rachel just doesn't care. And so, you know, this is basically about two people who have issues who collide and they don't necessarily like hurt each other in a really devastating literature kind of sense, right? But they are, their relationship is not healthy. And, you know, it really got me thinking about things like religious identity and choosing what's important to you and restrictions and lack thereof, what we can permit ourselves and, you know, the extent to which we want what we can't have or, or maybe even attracted to things that we think that we're scared of. So this book is uncomfortable. Uh, I will say that the sex scenes are not very romantic at all. In fact, they're really weird. Like Rachel's fantasies are bizarre. They're very mother and daughter oriented because she has mommy issues. They're very dominance oriented. And, you know, it's not sexy to read about, but it's certainly interesting. I will also say that there are moments where this book is absolutely hilarious. So this, this has been a very spoilery review, but this book had one of the funniest scenes I've read in literature in a long time. And for that, I will always treasure it because Rachel has such bizarre eating habits, she likes to eat alone and she doesn't like people to watch or judge her eat, which I also think is really fascinating, right? There's like a, a pervasive theme in this book of what, what you're comfortable with people seeing you doing and being. And, you know, I think we all feel kind of called out by something like that. But Rachel is so obsessed with eating alone that at one point she goes in the bathroom to eat by herself. But the problem with the bathroom is that there's more than one stall. And so she's just like waiting and waiting for the bathroom to be empty so she can have her like little... Um, taboo breaking eat on the go. It's it's she's just trying to eat a power bar by herself. All right, so this is page of fifty six for those of you who enjoy scatological humor in their literature. When the woman finished peeing, another woman came in and took over her stall immediately. When that woman finished, a third woman entered. This third woman made no noise. She simply sat there silently for a very long time. I knew she was waiting for me to leave so she could do her business. We were locked in a stalemate. And neither of us was moving. I think we've all, <laughs> I mean, who has had that kind of experience in a public bathroom, right? <laughs> I feel so bad for this neighbor at the stall next to this woman. All right. I was starving. It was now or never. I would have to let her win. As quietly as possible, I took the protein bar out of my purse. The wrapper made a loud crinkling sound when I opened it. I hoped that my neighbor would think it was a tampon wrapper. Gingerly, I took a bite and tried to chew quietly. The saliva in my mouth made juicy squelching noises. It was time to just say fuck it and surrender. I took my next bite with more gusto, chewing heartily. Suddenly, I heard a series of farts erupt from the stall next door. Then the sound of shit plopping, unmistakably diarrhea. Then more farts. I wondered if the woman felt ashamed knowing that I was there to hear it. Yes, she probably did. <laughs> What an exciting feeling. I was happy not to be the one who was ashamed for once. Then the smell hit me. I didn't know what to do. Should I finish the bar steeped in diarrhea smell? Should I go back to the party lightheaded with low blood sugar? As more shit fell, I was unable to continue eating. I swallowed my bite, put the bar in my bag, and flushed even though I had not peed. Like... <laughs> This just tickled me because it's so real in ways that a lot of literature really isn't. Like, I mean, I think everybody has gone into a public bathroom and just prayed that it would be empty. And I just really felt that scene. And so Broder creates these kind of weird situations and these really neurotic people. But she also puts them into scenarios that I think anyone can understand. And that is what makes Milkfed, I think, so weirdly compelling. So I know this is her sophomore novel. I did not read her debut, which is called The Pisces. It's about a merman. I think I'm probably going to go look that up because this was just such an unusual book. I think it's an acquired taste. I think there are going to be people who absolutely despise Milkfed. But for me, you know, great literature is something that makes you think and something that makes you wonder and something that kind of pushes your boundaries while also making you feel connected to what's happening. And this book definitely did that for me. So if you want something that's a little bit transgressive, uh, but also weirdly understandable, you should try out Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. Happy reading.